Once again, welcome brothers and sisters to this day presentation. Uh, we are in uh, number nine in the series the latter rain and today we shall be looking at uh, the beginning of uh, the loud cry and uh, I pray that uh, you will be blessed so let us pray Heavenly Father thank you so much for this day I pray that uh, your accompanying presence may be with us even the only presence of thy spirit that uh, you may guide us in this session the holy angels may minister unto us the things of heaven in Jesus name amen and so right now I want us to look at um, the presentation number nine that is the beginning of the loud cry there is so much uh, controversy surrounding the 1888 message and uh, the presentations by brother Wagona and uh, Eti Jones and their varied views of uh, what actually this message was, what it comprised, and uh, how shall we be able to recapture what we lost in 1888 so that uh, the Lord may be able to pour his uh, uh, spirit upon us that uh, the work may be accomplished. And so uh, uh, take your pen, take your paper, write the references. Uh, I'll be speaking of some things that maybe we have never heard uh some things that uh, need your attention and uh, write the references so that you may go and look at the context of everything and you may understand what i'm speaking about and so i'll be covering in this um, presentation some in-depth history of uh, 1888 and uh, what actually brought about um, the beginning of the loud cry and the latter rain and uh, what happened so that it ceased and what can we do so that we may recapture it uh, once again uh, uh, I'll be continuing. This uh, is a continuation of uh, the number seven and eight. Uh, in fact, from the number six, as in the day of the of Pentecost, number seven, the works of atonement, and yesterday presentation, the important things. So these uh, four presentations, uh, the previous three presentation and today's presentation, they are building on each other and. Uh, if uh, you missed one of it from number six as in the day of Pentecost, number seven, the works of atonement, and number eight, the important things, then you can just go on my page and be able to view and uh, write notes. And uh, uh, this is the last um, of uh, those four presentations just touching on the core issues of uh, uh, righteousness by faith, the loud cry, and the latter rain, how it was lost, and uh, how we can recapture it again. And so without uh, speaking a lot of things, I'd like to go to the presentation, the beginning of the, uh, of the loud cry, and uh, I'll be going through a lot of notes, and uh, I pray that uh, you have a good listening ear, and uh, you may stay away from distraction so that uh, you may be able to capture what you are saying. And so the time setting of uh, 1888 was so important. And uh, we read this, uh, prior to 1888, we had a ministerial institute that was discussing what will be done in, uh, what will be discussed in 1888 conference. October 10, November 5, 1888, ministerial institute and general conference session held at Minneapolis. 
After the meeting at Minneapolis, Dr. Kellogg was a converted man and we all knew it. We could see the converting power of God working in his heart and life. This is a statement be made by um, Sister White in the General Conference Bulletin, April 6, 1903. And so, uh, what will prompt the prophet of the Lord to say that uh, Dr. Kellogg was converted at this point? Does it mean that uh, between... Uh, 1870s to 1903, Dr. Kellogg was not a converted man. What is this that uh, Dr. Kellogg had uh, started involving himself in that uh, uh, prompted the prophetess to say in 1903 that Dr. Kellogg was a converted man? Was he not a converted man before that? Because Dr. Kellogg was in active service uh, from the late 1870s and then uh, 1880s, then we come to 1903. and all this period, the prophet says, the prophetess says in 1903 that Dr. Kellogg was a converted man. What is what was happening actually that made the prophetess say this? Uh, so, this is what Kellogg was actually doing that made the prophet say that he was a converted man. Remember, Dr. Kellogg was a medical missionary worker, and uh, this is what he was doing at that point. We read, I have given, this is the, the, the statements, these are the works that uh, Dr. Kellogg was doing. I have given quite a good deal of thought and study to this subject. My wife and I have given considerable attention to this work for a number of years. We have been planning to raise 40 or 50 children ourselves. Just as fast as we get any money, we will invest it in children. I have done that for several years. Every single dollar that can be saved from other necessary expenses goes into the education of children. So, you find that... Uh, Dr. Kellogg had started to do the work of uh, the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 58 and then the prophetess says that Dr. Kellogg is a converted man. And what prompted the prophetess to say that I'd like to read something um, about Sister White herself and the work that uh, she was herself doing and when she saw somebody else doing it, uh, she was prompted to say that uh, that person was a converted uh, person. Reading from uh, uh, reading from uh, let me see reading from uh, selected messages book one selected book selected messages book one from page thirty three uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put it here. This is what she was doing. The Lord gave me a great light on health reform. In connection with my husband, I was to be a medical missionary worker. I was to set an example to the church by taking the sick to my home and caring for them. This I have done, give, giving the women and children vigorous treatment. I was also to speak on the subject of Christian temperance as the Lord's appointed messenger. I engaged heartily in this work and spoke to large assemblies on temperance in its broadest and truest sense. So, Sister White was doing a work that Kellogg picked it up. I was instructed that I must ever urge upon those who profess to believe the truth, the necessity of practicing the truth. This means sanctification, and sanctification means the culture and training of every capability for the Lord's service. I was charged to neglect, I was charged not to neglect or pass by those who were being wronged. I was especially charged to protest against any arbitrary or overbearing action toward the ministers of the gospel by those having official authority. Disagreeable, though the duty may be, I am to reprove the oppressor and plead for justice. I am to present the necessity of maintaining justice and equity in all institutions. Then she goes ahead and says, I see those in positions of trust Neglecting aged ministers, I am to present the matter to those whose duty is to care for them. Ministers who have faithfully done their work are not to be forgotten or neglected when they have become feeble in health. Our conferences are not to, be to disregard the needs of those who have borne the burdens of the work. It was after John had grown old in the service of the Lord that he was exiled to Patmos. And on that lonely isle, he received more communication from heaven than he had received during the rest of his lifetime. After my marriage, I was instructed that I must show a special interest in the motherless and fatherless children, taking some under my own charge for a time and then finding homes for them. 
Thus, I'll be giving others an example that they could do. And who are these that she was giving an example? People like Dr. Kelo. Also called to travel often and having much writing to do. I have taken children of three and five years of age and have cared for them, educated them and trained them for responsible positions. I have taken into my home from time to time boys from 10 to 16 years of age, giving them monthly care, motherly care and a training for service. I have failed. It is my duty to bring before our people that work for which those in every church should feel a responsibility. While in Australia, I carried on this work, uh, in the same line of work, taking into my home orphan children who are in danger of being exposed to temptation that might cause the loss of their souls. In Australia, we, referring here to her associate workers, James White died in 1881, also worked as a Christian medical missionary. At times I made my home in Koranbong, an asylum for the sick and afflicted. My secretary who had received a training in the Battle Creek Sanitarium stood by my side and did the work of a missionary nurse. No charge was made for her services and we won the confidence of the people by the interest that we manifested in the sick and suffering. After time, the health retreat at Koranbong was built and then we were relieved of this burden. And so, Sister White was doing this work and once Kellogg picked up in doing this work in 1891, she immediately realized that actually Kellogg was a converted man. And so medical missionary work is a work that actually brings about conversion. And uh, Dr. Kellogg continuing in his teachings and his practices, he says, I do not believe we have any right to accumulate money. <laughs> I think as long as we are well and have God's blessing upon our work, it's our duty to spend what we earn in God's work. I do not believe that in this age any man has a right to accumulate money. This was in 1891 when actually in 1892, Sister White says that, um, uh, uh, in, um, that the loud cry has begun in the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ. In the revelation of Jesus Christ, we shall be seeing that statement. And so she says that uh, in 1903, after the meeting at Minneapolis, Dr. Kellogg was a converted man and we all knew it. We could see the converting power of God working in his heart and life because he had picked exactly the work that the prophetess was doing and he was teaching it. He goes on, uh, in that time there was instituted what we call the high school home. This was a home where actually uh, children were taken in and uh, there was a work of medical missionary uh, going on. This is a home that um, the, the work was going on. Uh, it was known as the Haskell home for orphan children and was all paid by Miss Carolyn Haskell uh, in memory of uh, her husband Charles Haskell who died and left uh, uh, a fair amount of money to her. Uh, this home costed uh, 30,000 US dollars and housed a uh, uh, hundred orphans. This, this home that, um, uh, let me put it on the screen. Let me just put it on the screen. This home of uh, Carolyn uh, Haskell. Yes, it was a home that housed a hundred children, mostly orphans. And uh, Dr. Kellogg entered into uh, this program and uh, we had visiting nurses programs going on there. And uh, Sister White acknowledged that actually this man was a converted man because of what he was doing. So in 1893, Ministerial Institute and General Conference session held at Battle Creek Elder A.T. Jones presents a 24-part series on studies of the third angel's message which goes from start to finish of the session. Dr. Kellogg presents a series of eight talks on medical mission and work between February 5 to 15. I'm giving a little history of the beginning of the latter rain, what transpired between 1888 to uh, 1903, where actually the prophet says that uh, Kellogg was converted. And so... Uh, Dr. Kellogg started an extra um, uh, a, an extra track called the medical missionary and uh, this extra 
medical missionary tract was to address the issues that pertains to uh, the book of Isaiah chapter 58. It was to bring in prominence the work that Seventh-day Adventists should be doing uh, in correspondence to the times that they were living in, in waiting, in anticipation of waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. They had a special work to be done. The Medical Missionary was a publication issued monthly under the auspices of International Health and Temperate Association. So, Dr. Kellogg handled such a things as um, health and temperance, and he had a special paper which he printed out and started circulating to the people. It was just not a normal monthly issue, it was a special issue. And uh, uh, Sister White came to recognize it. So this extra uh, medical missionary tract uh, comprised an abstract addressing and pa pa things pertaining to medical missionary work. And uh, in it, Dr. Kellogg goes into details about um, health and temperance and uh, benevolent association, the things that um, Seventh-day Adventists have to involve themselves in so as to say that the uh, loud cry can go ahead. So he encouraged the ministers to practice benevolent, to practice temperance and uh, to show the world that um, they believed in the health message that we are, are, are preaching about. And uh, you know that uh, much of the health message has been retarded by our ministers not taking it up and practicing it in their home life and even in the public where actually they did not set an example in the public of our health messages many people actually despise our health message because the people who are at the forefront the ministers the gospel workers do not practice what actually is found in our publications and so dr kellogg took up these issues and said that we need to have a practical gospel in our midst. We don't have just to preach about Christian temperance and medical missionary work. We have to practice it. If we have to realize the loud cry of the third angel's message, then we do not just need to talk about it, but we need to practice the message. And uh, most of the people who brought uh, a hindrance to this message were the people who were at the forefront, the leaders. They could not uh, practice the message. Uh, and this uh, caused uh, even a tension between Dr. Kellogg and the ministers at that time. It, it, it is some of the things that actually led Kellogg to apostasy because he felt that he was doing a work of the Lord, but he was not being appreciated by the church. And so he saw that um, he cannot continue in a system where God has given a message, but the message can't be practiced by the people who are in uh, positions of... Um, in higher positions. Uh, this is always which um, something that uh, drains the energy of many people. That um, a church or an organization has a message or <coughs> sorry, has something to implement. And uh, instead of the people who are in high positions practicing that which the organization are professing they set a bad example before the people and so the message is hindered not because the message per se is bad but um, the message is not accompanied by a good example by the people who are at the forefront and uh, this brought a lot of tension between dr kellogg and uh, the ministers uh, of the conferences and so one time actually uh, uh, I want to see what was the problem with Dr. Kellogg and the uh, uh, the problem he made with the leaders of the church. I, I, I'll just uh, screen this so that uh, we may be able to learn together. The provision stands and boarding tents at camp meetings cease to be object lesson for our people and those not of our faith. I want you to realize Dr. Kellogg was doing something. And the prophetess had said that Dr. Kellogg was converted. But when it came to come meetings and open air meetings, the people who were to practice the message actually were doing something else. Let us read together. 
The provision stands and boarding tents at camp meeting cease to be object lesson for our people and those not of our faith in helpful detectives. The camp meetings provision stand in the last decade has rarely failed to include in it is talk a good supply of lard, crackers, gingers, nuts, baker spice, and cakes of various sorts, dried beef, smoked halibut, salt, codfish, smoked herring, painted candies, and unwholesome knickknacks of various sorts, a good supply of cheese, ripe enough to be buried and lively enough to move on if not kept in a cage. He goes ahead and says, and in the background might usually be seen, arranged in pictures Q manner, sun recoils of sausages warranted, however, to be a bulgona, as I have frequently been told, which is a guarantee that the article is not Simon pure swine's flesh, but a miscellaneous assortment of all manner of beasts. So, Dr. Kellogg has something against the ministers not setting an example before the people. And this is something that happens in our meetings more often, that uh, instead of uh, the brethren showing uh, 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 that they are supporting the medical mission work and dietics and health reform, they have done things which are contrary to what is being preached. And so a health message has been rejected, not because it's not a good message, but because the way it has been presented and how the people have practiced the message. And so, continuing with the, 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 the statement that Dr. Kellogg had been converted, this is what Kellogg was uh, still talking about, quoting him, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in certain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So he was uh, uh, speaking against uh, this ama uh, amazing riches and yet neglecting to do the work of reaching unto the poor. He, he, he went ahead and quoted uh, 2 Timothy 3.17 and Titus 3.8 that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. And what good works was Caleb talking about when he was quoting these verses? Isaiah chapter 58 being practiced, not just preached. And that was the beginning of uh, the loud cry. And let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. Titus 3.14. These are the words Caleb was quoting in the Bible. That he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works he continues in first corinthians 11 1 paul's exhausts us be ye followers of me even as i also am of christ who peter tells us left us an example that you should follow his steps in acts 10 38 peter tells us that christ went about doing good it is evident then that if we are christ's servants if we follow christ we must also go out go about doing good we are not to wait for the opportunities for doing good. This look how Kellogg is putting these verses together and talking about the loud cry and the latter rain. And the prophet says that Kellogg is a converted man. He continues to say, We are not to wait for the opportunities for doing good to come to us. And this has been all our norm that we may we wait for opportunities to do good. But he's saying we should not wait for opportunities to go, do good, but we must go about doing good. And this is in um, in quoting Acts chapter 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and how he went about doing good. He did not wait for an opportunity to do good, but he went about doing good. And the same job description of Jesus Christ is the same job description for us, what he did. In fact, in the book of 1 John 2, 6, we are told that... Uh, Whoever says that he abideth in him must walk as he walked. So we should not wait for opportunities to do good, but we should create or go about doing good, seeking opportunities to do good, to help the needy, to bless and comfort the sorrowing, to uplift the fallen. We must search them out, not wait for them to hand us up and move us to action by their appeals. We are not to be narrow in our charities, for Paul says to us in Galatians 6.10, let us do good unto all men. It is true, he adds, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. 
But this does not excuse us from doing good to those who are not of the household of faith. For he says, all men, and certainly we cannot hide behind the, this apology, if we have not been good even to the, those belonging to the household. And uh, Dr. Kellogg is true in saying that uh, uh, we have not even been good to those who are of our own faith. Just look around. How many Seventh-day Adventists are suffering and the means are in our hands, yet we cannot go out and do something to them? So how will we be able to do good unto those who are not of our faith when those who are even of our faith, nothing seems to be done for them? Uh, and so Dr. Kellogg laments about these things. And uh, he goes ahead to say that... Uh, For years and years we have been well able to furnish a home for the aged, the infirm, the homeless, for poor widows, worn out ministers, aid pilgrims. Remember the statement of Sister White that her home was a home for children, orphans, the poor, worn out ministers and aged pilgrims who have retired from the work. And so Dr. Kellogg started to do the same thing that the prophetess was doing. And the prophetess, remember, she had been shown by the Lord the work that she should do. And here comes a man without even asking the prophetess what to do. He goes ahead and starts practicing what he sees the prophet practice. And so all pioneers in the cause who gave liberally for their property in the early days when the work was just beginning. And whose faith in the truth which we profess have led them to put all their earnings into the cause instead of holding up a competent for themselves. All these worthy and deserving ones who appeal to us on fraternal as well as humanitarian grounds we have neglected in a manner which has become a denominational uh, disgrace. And so the church had come to a place where it had neglected the widows, the fatherless, the orphans, and the aged ministers who gave everything when the work was starting. And yet now at this point they had nothing and the, the people whom they had offered all their all could not care less that these are the people who started the work and they need to be cared for. We have seen the widow's mother with her fatherless children working far beyond her strength in order to keep her little ones with her, Dr. Kellogg laments, and prevent them from suffering for food and clothing. Many a mother has thus died for over exertion while the people among us have had means to give to such a mothers and they have not done so a mother who has the true instincts of self respect will not go from door to door begging she will suffer rather than complain and because people do not complain because they do not claim for assistance we do not stop to think that they may be suffering we seldom inquire after them this is the lamentation by dr kellogg how little has been done by us as a people for this class please think of that this was said two years ago. How little has been done by us as a people for this class, for mothers, for widowed mothers, have we not come far short of our duty? We are not doing as much as done by other denominations. Now I don't say this, the Lord says it. This is a speech by Dr. Kellogg. This is what he saw that was going on and he could not see how the loud cry and the latter rain will fall on the church and the proclamation be made while the people are neglecting the things that the Lord had said that they should be done. He says, goes ahead and says that uh, uh, we have set ourselves up on a high pinnacle and say we are God's people, we, got, we are God's special people. Or our cause is the Lord's cause, and we talk about ourselves as being the peculiar people. And yet we are not doing as much Christian work and Christian work of very important character as other denominations are doing. Again, it is right that more should be expected of us than of others. The Bible teaches us the same thing, that we ought to be doing more than others, but we are doing less. Now, can we expect the loud cry to begin when we are so neglectful of the needy around us. We may imagine that the Lord is going to work miracle for us and do this work for himself, but he will not. We need not expect that the loud cry will begin until we do what the Lord wants us to do. Here, Dr. Kelo grappled feathers because the prophet had just said 
that the loud cry had begun. Yet Dr. Kellogg is saying that the loud cry has not begun. But we shall justify that in a moment. So when he spoke this, there were voices heard in the meeting. A voice was heard saying, the loud cry has already begun. Dr. Kellogg answered, we ought to be able to show that we are doing what the Lord says should be done first. Voice, it has begun. Dr. Kellogg then retorted, then we shall see this work that the Lord tells us must be done begin right away. The congregation. Now the question is whether Seventh-day Adventists are going to live in this work or is it going to be left for someone else to do? The Lord has given us here a very precious work to do. It is not the whole of the third angel's message, but it's a part of it. You read in Isaiah 58, How can we make our light shine? If thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. Remember, this is the presentation, the beginning of the loud cry, the history of 1888 to uh, 1893, when the prophet says, that the loud cry has begun in the revelation of the angel of revelation chapter 18 and so here is Kellogg making his speech and presentation and he ruffles feathers by saying that the loud cry has not begun yet the prophet has said it has begun but we will see how Kellogg was speaking the same thing that uh, the prophetess says and how we can marry these things and so question from the congregation don't you think the loud cry has commenced answer i don't know i am presenting this subject as of medical mission work from my standpoint there is everything to indicate that the lord is anxious to have the loud cry begin to sound but he says these things referred to in isaiah 58 must first be done and so far the things that have been done in this direction have been done by other people not us so what is the secret? The prophet has said the loud cry has begun. Dr. Kellogg says that the loud cry has not begun. And when he is questioned, if he believes that the loud cry has begun, he says that what we ought to do, we are not doing it, but other people are doing it. And so he is relating this story that the loud cry beginning, as the prophetess says, it is not by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but the world are doing the work that actually has made the loud cry begin and as a denomination we are far beyond to sounding this loud cry she, uh, dr kellogg's continues in his conclusion brother jones may be right in thinking that the time has come for the loud cry to begin but if the loud cry has begun by our people it must be because we have just begun to do a little in the way of letting our light shine but we have done so little in that way that it seems to me that before the loud cry will make any great noise in the world, we will have to let our light shine a great deal brighter than we have ever yet done, because the works come first. The light must shine through these good works before we can be called the preparers of the bridge and the restorers of paths to dwell in. For that promise comes after all these conditions we see. He says, we had a testimony over 30 years ago saying that we are, we are, as a people were to rise higher and higher but it does not appear from testimonies received at different times since that one was given that we have risen perceptibly from the, that time until now a period of over 30 years how is the loud cry going to be given through us when a large part of the denomination are 30 years behind time and sounding are not altogether out of tune pause for a minute you see the contention that Brother Kellogg has. The other denominations are doing a work that we should be doing. And as a, as a people, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have just begun a little work, as was pointed out 30 plus years ago. And so we cannot, in that period, they could not say that they were sounding or they had, they were fully sounding the loud cry and the latter rain was falling on them. Because that which was supposed to be done the work of Isaiah chapter 58, the works of atonement, the important things were not being done by us, but by other denominations. Now, this is not something um, so strange because the Lord says that if we do not do the work, the stones will cry out. And so the stones were crying out at that time. Remember in 1888, 1889, towards 1900, the Sunday law was being uh, uh, agitated and we had the Blair uh, debate 
the Blair bill in the parliament where actually Jonas went and uh, was able to counteract it and the Lord stayed the passing of the Sunday law and the people had a period of time to rethink what they were doing and uh, we have been stuck here for all those 170 plus years. Why? Because what was going on at that period, preparing the church for translation, has not been picked by the church. We are in debates on how the latter rain should come. We are in debates of what is the loud cry. Instead of just revisiting 1888-1903 period and seeing what the prophetess was saying and what Caleb was saying and Wagona and Jonas and pick up the work. And then we shall see the beginning of that loud cry and the latter rain, and then it shall swell. And then we shall see Christ coming in the clouds of the air. But uh, remember, the children of darkness have become worse than the children of the light. You, 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 can, be, you, you can be a witness to me that the work that the Seventh Day Adventists should be doing is being done more, even this period, by those who are not of our denomination. Our denomination has fallen behind in this work. We must do the work which the Lord has told us to do and which we have left undone. We must do our duty in relation to health principles and benevolence in connection with other questions. We must heed the light and accept the whole truth, brothers and sisters, before we can expect the Lord to sound the loud cry through us. We cannot say that the loud cry will begin. But if we even refuse... To participate in the things that we should do so as the loud cry and the latter rain should fall upon us. The Lord will use other people. He will use stones. He will use other denominations. In fact, when uh, I, I want to show you something uh, that the Lord will do if we do not come up to a position where we can uh, do the work that we have been entrusted to do. This is in Lift Him Up. Uh, not lift him up, but upward look, page 131, paragraph 3. Upward look. The Lord Jesus will always have a chosen people to serve him. When the Jewish people rejected Christ, the Prince of Life, he took from them the kingdom of God and gave it unto the Gentiles. The kingdom will be taken from the Seventh-day Adventists and given to Sunday keepers if we do not come up to the work that the Lord has told us to do. God will continue to work on this principle with every branch of his work. When a church proves unfaithful to the word of the Lord, whatever their position may be, however high and sacred their calling, the Lord can no longer work with them. Others are then chosen to bear important responsibilities. But if these in turn do not purify their lives from every wrong action, if they do not establish pure and holy principles in all their borders, then the Lord will grievously afflict and humble them, and unless they repent, will remove them from their place and make them a reproach. So, Seventh-day Advent is not just that special church that will continue in apostasy and the Lord will accept it is apostasy. He will continue to work on the same principles he worked with the Jewish church. He'll take away from them the candles he can give to others if we do not come up to the duties that we should be doing. And so, if Dr. Kellogg, his argument was that uh, uh, if the loud cry has begun by our people, it must be because we have just begun to do a little in the way of letting our light shine. But we must do it more than ever before. The time of test is just upon us. Review and Herald, November 22, 1892. Remember, the statements that Kellogg is giving that the latter rain has not begun in 1893, it's in 1893. But in 1892, this is what had been put in Review and Herald by the prophetess. The time of taste is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. Now, I want you to understand this quote better so that you may, be, you, you may understand the crux of the issue between Kellogg and the prophetess. They are not differing. They are just on the same line. Here is Kellogg in 1893 saying that the loud cry has not begun. Here is the prophet saying that uh, in 1892 that uh, the loud cry had begun. So what is actually the issue? What is the crux of the matter? I want you to observe the quote very well. The time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation. Now check this out. So it is the revelation. 
that was going on. What is a revelation? Uh, um, this is um, a revealing of what should be done. So, in revealing what has been done, the prophetess says that the loud cry has begun. In what? In the revelation. So, this is not the proclamation of the third angel. This is a revelation of the loud cry of the third angel. Get it well. There is a difference between a revelation and a proclamation. A revelation is an unfolding of the message which has been sealed or anything that has been sealed. But a proclamation, it is the actual manifestation of that thing among the people who have received the revelation. Did you get that? I'll repeat. The prophetess says in 1892, the time of test is just upon us for the loud cry of the third angels. The third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin pardoning redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. So the prophetess doesn't say that the proclamation has begun. She says that the revelation of the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been seen. And this is the beginning of the loud cry. And so, in this revelation, what had to follow was a proclamation, a manifestation of the revelation they had received. And this was the crux of the matter between the prophetess and Dr. Kellogg. And I don't see them at variance, but I see it in harmony what the prophetess was saying and what Kellogg was saying. Kellogg is arguing about a manifestation of the work of Isaiah 58. The prophetess is talking about the revelation of the work of Isaiah 58. And so they are all together the same. One thing the prophetess saying and Kellogg saying another thing. And so she says that this is the glory that shall fill the whole earth. We shall see the medical missionary work. She says we shall see, not we see. We shall see the medical missionary work broadening and deepening at every point of its progress until the whole earth is covered as the waters cover the sea. So, in 1892, there was a revelation of the work that should be done, the work of Isaiah 58. In 1893, Kellogg talks about the work now has begun by the proclamation of it, by a little work being done with uh, by Seventh-day Adventists, he being one of them who had... Uh, uh, who had... Uh, made a home or who was using the home of Caroline Haskell to house orphans, the aged people and to provide for the needy, the widows and uh, all this work. Now there was a proclamation, the manifestation of the work of Isaiah 58, not just a revelation of it. I want to tell you that when the gospel ministers and the medical missionary workers are not united, there is placed in our churches the worst evil that can be placed there. And so the reason why Kellogg did not agree with many ministers is just because they were separating the gospel work and the medical missionary work. Yet the prophetess said that the medical missionary work, the health work, is the right arm of the third angel's message. And the third angel's message is a gospel proclaimed, a gospel manifested. And so you cannot say that you are having a gospel which doesn't have the right arm. What will be the benefit of the gospel that doesn't have the right arm? This is the crux of the matter. Our medical missionaries ought to be interested in the work of our conferences and our conferences workers ought to be as much interested in the work of our medical missionaries. This is the beginning of the loud cry, number nine in the series, The Latter Rain, the crisis in 1888 to 1903. So the heart of the message, Isaiah 58, what is the heart of this message? Loma Linda messages, page 143. There is to be a working of our cities as they never have been worked. That which should have been done 20 years, more than 20 years ago, is now to be done speedily. Can you see the work that should be done in order for the loud cry to begin, in order for the light, latter rain to fall on the people of God? Continued on. Henceforth, medical missionary work is to be carried forward with an earnestness E with which it has never yet been carried. The work is the door through which the truth is to find entrance to the large cities. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 9, page 167. In every city there should be a city mission that will be a training school for workers. Many of our brethren must stand condemned in the sight of God because they have not done the very work that God 
will have them to do. Medical ministry, page 303. Now, let me pause here for a moment. You tell me, fellow Seventh-day Adventists, uh, I'll just go back to the presentation because the camera is dark. How many mission senders do we have in the city training up workers to go outside and do the work? Please, PM me one of them. Send me a personal message of a any mission in the city which is training workers to finish the work. I'll be happy to, I'll be glad to see it. The prophetess says the Avondale school was established not to be like the schools of the world but as God revealed to be a pattern of school. What was Avondale school doing in Australia? You go and read the whole context. It was carrying on the gospel work accompanied by medical missionary work. The light which has been given me regarding the work of the Avondale school is that we must not pattern after the similitude of any school which has already been established. Avondale school was set aside to be a a blueprint of other schools that will be established in the latter period where actually the gospel had to unite with the medical missionary work. Yet you find in our churches that the medical missionary work is so despised by our pastors, by our conference leaders, by union leaders and more so even by the church members, the laity who have been called to stand in the bridge when the clergy are asleep. Where are the watchmen on Zion's wall? The school in Avondale is to be a pattern of other schools which shall be established among our people. Manuscript Releases, Volume 8, page 74. Not only should we have gospel uh, 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 training schools, but we should have schools which actually those who qualify to go outside and do gospel work are equipped as medical missionaries where uh, they are able to attend to diseases, they are able to attend to uh, the health of the people. When a minister goes out, when he is equipped with the Bible and the health principles, as a hand and glove, the work shall be so successful that uh, the Lord will open up ways that has been closed. It is God's purpose that there shall be a true pattern in Australia, a symbol of how other fields shall be worked. The work should be symmetrical and a living witness for the truth. And I have just told you that Avondale School in Australia, it did not just do the gospel work, but it, comp it uh, combined the gospel work and the health work, the medical mission work. And uh, here is uh, uh, Willie White talking to Dr. F.T. Lamb, August 23, 1899. He says, It has been presented to Mother that Australia is a field in which we will do a model work, a work that will show to our friends and brethren in other lands how the evangelistic work and the medical work should be carried forward in perfect agreement, in perfect harmony, blended together. May I pause and say that no one should go outside to preach the three angels' messages if he should, is not versed in the medical mission work. If he has no idea of how to reach to the sick and compel them to give up their darling uh, lifestyle so that Christ may work in their lives. You will see that statement later. And so, there was established a working men's home and a medical mission. That home was to train people up for Bible work and medical mission. It was uh, an all under one roof uh, home where actually we had uh, there uh, people being ministered to, the orphans, the widows, the aged ministers, and the gospel workers being sent out equipped with the medical uh, uh, skills to be able to minister to the needy. And... Uh, Continued on. Oh, how thankful I shall be when we can see the work going with power and many souls compelled to come from the highways and hedges because of the overwhelming evidence of the truth that the Lord impresses upon the human heart. Review and Herald, May 29, 1894. We cannot with our will sway back the wave of poverty which is sweeping over this country, but just as far as the Lord shall provide us with means, we shall break every yoke and let the oppressed go free manuscript releases volume 1669 i will i would like you to take you to a success story here is sister white reporting about evangelism combined with medical missionary work here is the success story she sister white herself is reporting 
I started out with Sister Louise last Sunday morning to visit some of the subjects for the purpose of taking a few photographs to throw upon the screen in talking about this work and to inter interest people in it. I had no sooner turned the corner than a little girl shouted at the top of her voice, Oh, here is Sister Louise, and ran and threw her arms about her and expressed the greatest delight at seeing her. Her cries attracted others and soon children were running from every direction shouting, Sister Louise! And in a few minutes, there was such a crowd I had to go out in the middle of the street. Sister White continues, they fairly, pulled, they fairly pulled and pushed her along the street. There was such a mob of them. They filled up the sidewalk away and out into the street. And before we had gone a block, there were more than 50 children in all, all worshipping Sister Louise. I felt very small and insignificant beside Queen Louise. What was Queen Louise doing? medical evangelism mixed with combined with medical missionary work and she had been known over the city because she was not just telling people how they are sinful and how christ accepts them but he was doing the work in christ's method alone mh 143 mingling with the people seeing their needs providing for them and then bidding them follow me Sister Louise had been in their homes and nursed them when they were sick and given up to die. Some of them had nursed, some of them had nursed their mothers and cared for them and had shown them how to clean up their homes and make them brighter. Had given them little picture cards and flowers and had said kind words to them and like their parents they were ready to go down on their knees to her. Shall we see such a work? It is no trouble for any of our nurses to gather any number of children together for a Sabbath school and no trouble to keep them absolutely quiet, even though they are brought in from the very lowest hands of vice in the city. It is perfectly wonderful what power there is in the influence of medical missionary work. Sometimes we go to the church and the children cannot keep quiet. Why? But Sister Louise had a success story. She could have children in the church quiet. Why? She was practicing evangelism and she had combined it with medical missionary work. And so the children, she says, and the mothers were ready to go down on their knees to her because of the work she was doing. And when she told them, it is time to keep quiet in the church, they could keep quiet. And then the Sabbath will be observed in a reverential manner, not like the Sabbath is observed in today's churches, where actually the children cannot listen to no one, even their parents, the deacons, the deaconess, no one can the children listen to because they have not been taught an experiential knowledge of who God is. Brothers and sisters, what is the path of infant? A committee was appointed to solicit contribution and encouraging offers of help have been received including a donation of two guineas from a member of Fizzo City Council. We look for good results. People were benevolent to this work. And as this was going on, Sister White says that the loud cry has been has begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin pardoning redeemer. And then Dr. Kellogg says that now we have just seen the beginning of it, but more shall be seen if we take up the work. I'll skip over some things and uh, I'll come back to them later in some of the presentations. Here is uh, one story that is told. One man who has experienced the new birth this year says, Nine months ago I was a drunkard. My wife had left me. I was hopeless. Today I'm a Christian, a sober man, and have my home restored. Another says, I have learned to trust the Lord this year. Another testimony is, Twelve months ago I was friendless in Melbourne. Today I have friends, work and hope. Why? The gospel work combined with the medical missionaries will penetrate and this will be the swelling of the loud cry. This is 1900. Assessing the progress, I have felt that it was just as grave an error for Dr. Kellogg to make everything of the health work and belittle the evangelistic work as he virtually does by magnifying the one so far above the other. So, there reached a time that uh, Dr. Kellogg was not agreeing with the ministers of the church because they solely concentrated on the gospel work and he went ahead and now separated the gospel work and started the health work. So medical missionary work was separated from evangelistic work and then 
Sister White says that now this is coming to a place which is not good. And when we have that, it becomes a curse to the church. And so, she goes ahead and says, Dr. De Kellogg has never been able to understand why our conferences should not employ them to work in the interest of the sick and suffering and to instruct our people in the principles of health for living. The same as many workers trained at the sanitarium are employed by the conferences. He has been very much dissatisfied that Brother Siemens was so largely employed in evangelistic work. Now, there came to be a difference in the sanitarium whether even the medical missionary workers should be paid by tithe or they should not be paid by tithe. And Sister White talked about the people narrowing down the work and saying that there have been so narrowing down of the ideas of the brethren and she said that uh, the gospel worker who goes outside to do the work combined with the medical missionary work should be paid from the tithe by the conference yet actually we don't see that happening we don't see that happening in our days and i'm skipping over the information that uh, i have repeated i have already presented in uh, other places she says i wish to tell you that soon there will be no work done in ministerial lands but medical mission work the work of mission mission minister is to minister our ministers are to work on the gospel plan of ministry had you carried the work forward in the lands in which god intended you to do had you done medical mission work trying to heal soul and body you will have seen hundreds and thousands coming into the truth you will never be ministers after the gospel order till you show a decided interest in medical mission work and this is the point that i was saying and this is where i'm coming to an end if you are not interested in the medical mission work there is no reason for you going outside there as a gospel work if the two can be blended then there is no success in the work come up to the help of the lord to the help of the lord against the mighty powers of darkness that it be not said of you cause kazi meroz kazi bitterly the inhabitants thereof because they came not to the help of the lord and so here we conclude several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message i have answered it is the third angel's message in verity the message of christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the lord this is the glory of god which closes the work of the third angels the last message of must be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. How is this revealed in the 58th chapter of Isaiah? This is the last slide. What said the Lord in the 58th chapter of Isaiah? The whole chapter is of the highest importance. It's not this, is it not this the path that I have chosen? God asks to lose the bands of the wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and let the oppressed go free, and that you break every oath. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? This is the work that the Lord has commanded. If thou turn away the food from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not in doing thy own way, nor finding thy own pleasure, nor seeking thy own words, then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I'll cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Brothers and sisters, if we will see the loud cry go forth and the latter then attend to our message, then we have to hear the message of Isaiah chapter 58. Closing on the 58th chapter of Isaiah contains present truth for the people of God. Here we see medical missionary work and the gospel ministry are to be bound together as the message is given to the world. Upon those who keep the Sabbath of the Lord is laid the responsibility of doing a work of mercy and benevolence. Medical missionary work is to be bound up with the message and sealed with the seal of God. So Isaiah chapter 58, we are told it is the third angel's message, it is justification in verity, and for it to be justification by faith and the third angel's message in verity, then it has to be combined with the medical missionary work and so reading the words in capital the prophet is addressing sabbath keepers not sinners 
not unbelievers, but those who make great pretension to godliness. It is not the abundance of your meetings that God accepts. It is not the numerous prayers, but the right doing, doing the right thing at the right time. It is to bless self, to bless, it's to be less self-sacrificing and more benevolent. Our soul must expand. And so, brothers and sisters, if we will see the work that has been the, the work of the third angel's message going justification by faith going forward then we will have to embrace the medical missionary work otherwise the lord bless you think about the things that i have spoken about we are living in days where we have to see the third angel's message going forward the beginning of the loud cry and the latter rain but this cannot be done if we do not embrace the work of isaiah chapter 58 may the lord embrace these things upon us and may he give us strength to be able to do it let us pray heavenly father we thank you even for the rains we thank you for you are good and what you purposed us to learn this day we have learned it so help us to put it in practice it is in jesus name i pray amen